The Idris is part of, of the UE fleet, so you've got the Idris, you've got the Javelin, um, and obviously you've got the Bengal. Um, so they're, they're the big boys, uh, the big guns as we called them. The original kind of idea and concept came from a collaboration with Chris and, and Ryan Church at the time. Uh, it started off as a much kind of smaller ship to what it is now. You can look back on the internet actually and find and find you know the original kind of concepts for that ship. It's it's small. What we initially did was we kind of uh, we set it up as a small ship basically. So we we followed all the guides for small ships. So like uh, it's divided into chunks: body, nose, left wing, right wing. And um, we we put all the hard points on it just to make sure it could function like that. And then we started uh, working towards setting up the interior. So we tried to get all the interior objects inside it. But then that's where we started encountering some of the initial uh, like early technical limitations where loading the Idris was taking ages. Uh, we were using, uh, they weren't object containers, they were something else, I've forgotten the name of them completely now. But like what was happening is they were trying to load and they were loading just piles and piles of files that they really shouldn't have been doing, which was slowing everything down. So we had Steve Humphreys, one of our coders, uh, he spent a while and he set up creating these object containers which we could just compile a bunch of these items into like a chunk of the ship and then export that and the Idris was the first ship we tried that on and we had to experiment with like how do we divide the ship up and we, we eventually like after a few months we settled on something that seemed to work quite well and it's just it's just kind of getting this kind of iterative process for all the new systems that are going in and yeah object containers is kind of like it's one of the biggest that, that it happened with but there's loads more going on in there. So pretty much every bit of new tech that's come into the ship pipeline or like um, volumetric fog or anything like that has gone into the Idris first. It's been like the test ground for every other ship. Um, it's the biggest ship and it's like the main hub in Squadron 42. So um, we want to get that right to set the standards for all other capital ships. It plays an integral kind of role in, in Squadron. It's pretty much your home uh, that you kind of go back to an awful lot. So it needed to facilitate a lot more kind of, um, a lot more of the script, a lot more gameplay. Uh, so over time it kind of grew. It was one of our obviously highest priorities. So we had to work out from pretty much the inside out, like the layout of the ship from scratch to facilitate not only kind of decent gameplay, decent gunplay, um, balance, balancing the gameplay as well from a PU perspective, but also facilitating all the things that are required in the script. And that's really cool actually, because you, it kind of feeds your inspiration as to what kind of various areas can be. So, you know, it feeds, you know, we, we need a reactor room, we need a briefing room, we need a med bay, we need all these things. And, it, and it's kind of subconsciously fed into the design theory of every other ship that we've made since. So we've got these kind of archetypes now that we really kind of push through as much as possible to, to make sense of of each ship and I think the Idris was the first to do that correctly. Beyond being a ship it's almost a flying level. I mean there have been, I've heard discussions of people being like oh we could totally turn this into like an FPS level in space because the ship's so big and maybe one day that'll happen maybe they'll, they'll do something with that but like it's huge for a player ship. Uh, when I first started on it I got lost in it and I'm not ashamed to say I still get lost in it every now and then. You'll walk out the kitchen and be like, do I turn left or right to get to the nose of the ship, you know? We were putting a bunch of things to increase usability, so like the different sides are colour-coded, one side's green, one side's red, and we got, we got signposts everywhere. I don't think people realise how much the ship has. I think there um, is a lot of hidden places that people just don't realise, like pretty much every bit of the interior of the ship has been covered. There is not, we are actually struggling to find places to put more things into it because we were limited on um, um, the exterior, basically. We needed to get um, some airlocks into like the front section of the ship. And um, we're like, okay, where can we put these airlocks? And it's like, well, we can't put them on the side because of the angle of the front of the ship. So we've had to put them going up. But there's a lot of space on the exterior part at the front, but on the interior part, it wasn't, um, yeah, it's a bit tricky. We had to juggle a lot of rooms around and stuff and remove certain sections of the ship that didn't make sense anyway um, to fit certain rooms into it and just rejig things around. And I think for, it's all for the better. Because this ship is like very heavily used in um, Squadron, the interior was kind of set in stone when I first went onto it. So for a lot of the newer ships we've had set up, we've, we've kind of been able to set up like, this is the engineering bay, this is the living quarters, whatever, for the Idris. It's also very small. It's not quite that clear cut. It's kind of everything's right next to each other and it's all very sort of tightly packed into the ship. But I mean, you, you start off with the hangar at the, at the very base of the ship and it's, it's huge. You can fit three ships in there and there's cargo capacity along the sides of the hangar as well. 
um, along with cargo lifts to go up into um, the hangar bay on the floor above. But you, you then have like a couple of staircases which will take you up to the main deck of the ship. Pretty much everything else on the ship is. Uh, you've uh, at the nose, you've got like turret rooms, you've got the medi bay. Uh, behind that, you've got like the living quarters, the captain's quarters, the kitchen, and behind that, you've got the more engineering side of things. So you've, you've actually got the engineering room itself. There's um, airlocks back there. There's um, a briefing room as well if you like, if you want to just like talk to people and sort something out for the rest of your crew. And at the top, you've of course got the bridge, um, which is its own like self-contained beast with uh, eleven seats in there plus a radar or well, the hollow globe. It's just big and complicated. It had a lot of interesting challenges. Um, I think the original version of the hangar had, for example, like the main axis for the hangar was right in the middle of the hangar. Like these ladders came down out of the ceiling, which baffled me at the time. So it, it was really kind of working out kind of interesting ways where you can you can clear that runway space, and it is a runway at the end of the day, but also open up access to is the heart of the ship. So I open up access to the rest of the ship and was very kind of keen at the time to open up as many kind of portals of opportunity, I kind of call them, where, where you can see through into other sections of the ship. So you can walk out of the hangar, for example, you can walk for a good five minutes and you kind of double back on yourself and all of a sudden you're looking back down into the hangar. And there is, there is a degree of, you know, when you land, you look up and you can see these areas and it's like, okay, I want to get there. Uh, which feeds into the narrative of certain kind of chapters in in Squadron as well. So it's it, it's really kind of cool to to just kind of kind of link all that together. So when you're in this kind of hectic kind of hangar environment and you're looking up and you've got this kind of cool, calm habitation area, the two conflicting is is quite an interesting thing to look at. Um, and it makes the ship feel, even though it's huge, it kind of makes it feel a bit more personal. So we had to we had many challenges because we had obviously Squadron Forty Two which it features heavily in Squadron 42, it's your home base. It's where you come back to after each mission in the game. And um, it's where you can have a lot of downtime to get used to talking to other, other characters, getting to know the people on the ship, to try and get like this um, um, like emotional like, connection with everyone. It's your main base, essentially. So Squadron 42 is probably one of the main um, ones we've been gearing it towards. And then the Persistent Universe just come, is just stemmed from from the um, Squadron 42 version of the ship. Collaborative gameplay is probably like where this ship is gonna excel in compared to other areas. You're gonna need a big crew to run the ship. It's not like any other ship in the game. You're gonna need a hefty crew support with this ship. You can't run it on your own. It is, it's so big. This, um, to get from one point to another can take um, five minutes. And um, you're gonna need to be able to communicate with the, the rest of your party you need a crew to, to really fly this thing. Um, we've got a bunch of like seats on the bridge and what we've done is uh, each seat has a different priority. So the pilot seat has priority over the engines and if the pilot seat is then left unoccupied, if you have a co-pilot sitting in the co-pilot seat, they have priority on the engine. So the pilot can, I don't know, if they get killed and or go away or something, then the co-pilot will take control and do a lot of the flying for you. But they also will be able to do their own thing with their terminal. Then you have the weapon seat, which controls the gun. But the pilot can also control the gun if the weapon seat isn't being used. There's, there's this sort of interlaying uh, like dependency on the seats. So it's, it's worth having multiple people just because there's going to be a lot to do and one person won't be able to do it all. It's pretty much got what other ships have, but it's just on such a larger scale that I think it's going to really, it's going to hit people's like nostalgia of old like Star Wars movies. I think it's going to... It's, that's my most exciting part. It, we have a kind of ongoing little giggle about it. It kind of is good at everything. Like there's, there's nothing that I don't feel it's particularly weak at for that shy, size of ship. You can carry obviously three, three kind of Gladius small sized um, fighters in the hangar. We also have the Argo utility vehicle, um, which is, tucks into a, like a sub deck uh, underneath the ship, which is really interesting. It kind of drops down like uh, the aliens dropship scene, which is sweet. And then you've got, yeah, you've got pretty much everything else that it, it, it can do as well. You've got multiple turrets uh, across the top and the bottom of the ship. You've got the huge rail gun at the front, um, plenty of cargo space to the side of hangars. It's a level. Like it's, there's so much stuff in this ship that's actually physically flying through the universe with people sat in it and all the VFX are staying with it and all the, all the fog staying with it and all the usables are staying with it and all the components are staying with it. Everything, everything in there moves 
and it is interactable and this thing's flying at light speed through space so it's really impressive and you just get these moments like when i when we were we were, we were playing you know that demo over and over and over again in the run-up and then you get these breakthrough moments where they, they, they switched the camera to one guy at qa and he was just sat there looking out of the side window of, of the bridge and they were just leaving orbit and you're just like okay like but you get these moments that completely kind of change your attitude to 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 things and and it kind of makes you want to go even further it's hard like it is really hard to do that stuff and you can kind of it takes its toll on you as, a, as an individual but then you get these moments and you're just like yes this is what makes it all worth it the idris originally envisioned by celebrated concept artist ryan church is one of the signature ships appearing in the upcoming squadron 42. I'm pleased to announce that much like the Javelin we discussed last month, due to its size, the Idris is in all of final art phase, where in the hands of the Squadron 42 art team, they're currently working on the various set dressings and special lighting setups necessary to turn it into one of the many cinematic locations you'll visit in the game. It's this combination of immense size and impressively cinematic Squadron 42 game needs that means there's still plenty of work left to be done before this vessel moves into flight prep. But you can be certain, when that time comes, 